members of the DLAC committee, DLAC parents and guests, and district staff to our first meeting of the new school year. I am Martha Insminger, DLAC coordinator, and we thank you for your attendance. It is without a doubt we would have liked to have our meeting under different circumstances in person. However, we face challenges that call for us to do an extraordinary effort to meet virtually to fulfill our commitment to you, our parents, and our community. Thank you very much for your continued support to our DLAC committee. We look forward to listening to your valuable opinions and suggestions throughout the year as we engage in positive dialogues and thought exchanges that will provide meaningful recommendations to our Board of Education as we provide programs and services to support our English learners, students district-wide. To continue with our agenda items, I would like to invite our Assistant Director at the EACCR office, Mr. James Suarez, to share some important information regarding our attendance sign-in sheet process and the public comments for this meeting. Thank you. And thank you, Martha, I appreciate it. Well, welcome to a new and highly unusual school year and the very unusual reality of virtual meetings. What we really want is a meeting where we are in normal, our normal room at Martin Luther King Jr. Park. We acknowledge what you may be feeling today, and we agree this virtual meeting does not replicate the feel or the energy of an in-person meeting. And once we are clear to do so in a safe and responsible manner, there is nothing that we want more than to open schools for students and hold in-person meetings together. To make the best of this virtual situation, we are trying something new with respect to comments and to the time. In the past, I've had the honor and privilege of working with both important committees, DLAC and DCAC. I've worked very hard to try and give relevant presentations to inform and engage with the legal tasks of the committees and then ask for feedback. But quite frankly, I feel rushed to provide the information. And I think that you too may feel rushed to provide quality feedback. Not enough time for the membership to digest and process all the information received. Like maybe you've had a thought while driving home or another comment the next day. So today we're trying something new. We have a public comment today as a Google form which is currently available and will continue to accept comments for the next 48 hours. We think that this method better lends itself to more time to form your thoughts, questions, concerns, and other comments. The direct link to the Google form for comments is listed on the agenda, as well as directly below the YouTube broadcast. I have a couple of slides that I'll share with you to show you where these can be found. Bear with me as I share my screen. Here we go. So what you see here are helpful links today to access the agenda, and it's a bit.ly, bit.ly, slash DLAC agenda 82520, which is the date. For the draft plan, we ask that you go to our school website, or our district website, and when you hit the district website, Scroll down a little bit and what you'll see is something called local control. If you click on that, you will find the draft plan in English, Spanish, and Khmer. Two other areas that we need to talk about are the areas, excuse me, are the areas for sign in today, which is another bit.ly, bit.ly slash August or aug for August 25 sign in. And for comments that I was just referring to that will be available for the next 48 hours is another bit.ly and it's bit.ly slash aug25 comments. We ask you to sign in today so that we're able to respond to you in writing for all of the comments that are submitted. But also we need to make sure because we're in a, DCAC, a DLAC meeting that we have the attendance for the day. 
If you are watching this on a cell phone, in order to get to the comp, the, all the different links, there's a little toggle switch right here. If you click the toggle switch, all of the same links that I just shared are right here. Or if you are online today on YouTube, there's a little dialogue that says show more right underneath where you're watching. If you click show more, you will be able to access these links as well. Again, we are very thankful that you have decided to spend some time with us today in a not so perfect virtual environment. We do ask for your patience and grace as together as a community, we navigate a new meeting environment. I appreciate your time today and I'm going to throw it over to our executive director, Robert Tabrota. Good afternoon. I wanted to, um, first and foremost, before I bring up the presentation that we have for DLAC today, just want to spend a few minutes um, talking to you personally about some of the challenges that we as a society and as a community are facing. We understand the predicament and, and the uh, hardships that many of you are experiencing, uh, your lived experiences, uh, your struggles, and um, we're so greatly appreciative that you're even here with us today at this very moment, um, being able to share in dialogue with us. Uh, we fully recognize that this is not the kind of dialogue we're accustomed to as a DLAC committee. Uh, we're used to being together, as, as Jim and Martha mentioned, over at MLK, MLK Park, um, where we've always had our meetings uh, together um, with, with coffee and pastries, uh, and being able to share with each other, collaborate with each other, um, have chart paper up on the wall uh, so that we can engage in, in providing feedback under normal circumstances. And it's um, for many of us here in, our, um, in the district, um, staff members here that, that support you, um, we really miss uh, those engagements that we have with you. And I, and I know I can speak for both Martha and Jim uh, when we say that we, um, are looking forward to the days when we can actually get together again at MLK Park or wherever that may be. Uh, so at this particular time, we, we again ask for your patience and your understanding, and we thank you for your flexibility and your resilience and, uh, and your candor with the district during these difficult times. Um, so now at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. And you will see here, um, pre presentation that we're having for this committee meeting. Uh, so for our agenda for today is first to talk about our meeting outcomes, describe the budget engagement process, and then how that fits with our learning continuity and attendance plan. You're gonna hear that term continuously today, either referred to as a learning continuity and attendance plan or the learning continuity plan. It's a new state requirement that allows us to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll go over in great detail exactly how that fits with everything that we're doing in the district. Uh, and then lastly, we're gonna talk about next steps for additional engagement. Um, but here I wanna pause for a moment just to say thank you again to Martha to Jim, to our staff. We have translators working right now to support you, our multimedia team and, and tech teams. Um, and also uh, we're privileged right now to have a couple of members of our budget engagement team. And I wanted to introduce them to you by name and then ask one of them to um, greet you with some opening remarks. Uh, the first is our uh, director for community engagement, Lucy Salazar. Uh, Dr. Salazar is responsible for our budget engagement process, and you'll see her and the rest of our team um, more so in the coming weeks to talk about um, your feedback and what, why it means so much to us. Uh, Renee Arcus um, is here also from our business department, and uh, she can shed some light on the district's budget and other issues that relate to, um, to uh, the fiscal situation that the district is in. And then uh, Yumi Takahashi is our 
Chief Business and Financial Officer. Uh, she's our designee right now for our superintendent, uh, Dr. Jill Baker. And at this point, I'd like to just uh, pause for a moment and invite Yumi to um, provide some opening remarks to the group. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, this is my first time with you, and I so wish that I could see you, that I could hear your voices, um, but that's the reality of today and having to conduct our meetings virtually. We are wishing just as much as you are that we could be in the same room together. So at this time, we're just at a really important time for our school district. The challenges that we are met with are really without equal. And I really wanna um, reiterate and just affirm what Robert said about in terms of understanding the challenges that everyone faces and really recognizing and affirming your lived experiences through this and the appreciation we have um, for your being here with us today. But we, as, as you feel and that we feel, we're really starting the school year with the drive to see that all of our students are well, not just academically, but also social, social, socially and emotionally, and that all of our parents and community are best equipped to support our students. So today we're going through a budget engagement process. Um, our first attempt to engage with you this year, as well as on the local control, local control, the learning continuity and attendance plan, and really acknowledging that the voice that you bring to the table is critical, not just in our work today, but going forward as we continue our work together. So we appreciate and ask for your patience as we navigate this new modality of meeting. And again, want to want to uh, reiterate how appreciative we are to have you here with us today. So I'll now hand it over to Robert. Thank you. So this time I wanted to introduce the meeting outcomes for today. Um, first, it's to understand LBUSC's budget engagement process and how the learning continuity and attendance plan aligns with it. Second, we wanna be able to understand the basic components of the learning continuity and attendance plan. Um, and then lastly, to be able to collect your ideas on this plan through three guiding questions. And I'll explain what those questions are at, at various points during this process, but the guiding questions have emerged from feedback that you've already provided us in many different forms. And the guiding questions you should note uh, is one way that we're honoring uh, the ideas that you've already presented to the Board of Education and to the district. First, let's talk about the uh, budget engagement process. And the best way to think about this uh, entire system is with this triangle graphic. So you'll note from the top um, that there is a, a red arrow talking about a thought exchange. And then you'll see at the bottom right corner, uh, community forums, and then on the lower left corner, district and community stakeholder groups. So I'll go through, through each of those pieces and then talk about how they fit in with our superintendent's advisory committee in this framework. Uh, the thought exchange is really a broad based way that we're seeking to collect information and feedback from stakeholders. So think of this as a survey that we've sent out to all of the stakeholders that we have in the district, students, parents, teachers, administrators, staff, community members, and other partners of the district, providing us with general information on thoughts that they have about priorities that are important for our students in the district. Uh, then from there, there, there are additional opportunities to engage 
regarding the budget through community forums. Um, they look like this one that we're in right now, uh, conducted virtually, but it's an opportunity to get deeper into a particular topic um, or a particular series of questions so that we can uh, determine what priorities or ideas stakeholders may have uh, regarding our budget. And then even more specifically, you know, we have our district and community stakeholder groups of which this DLAC committee is one, right? So with the District English Learner Advisory Committee, uh, we have uh, an opportunity to take a look at um, how these issues specifically get addressed with the needs of an important committee such as this one. All of these feedbacks then get collected and then are provided to the superintendent's advisory committee. And the, the superintendent's advisory committee is tasked to provide um, feedback and recommendations to the superintendent and members of the board. Um, all, all together, what we're seeing here are basically multiple ways for parents, for students, for staff and community members to participate. Uh, so we'll go over in depth some of how um, those things kind of look and appear. Here is, um, here's our budget engagement timeline. So with this process, you can see that we've, we've got a series of events that stretch from August through mid-November. And um, they encompass many of the processes and activities that were described in the previous graphic um, with, with the thought exchange, with the community forums, and with the uh, district and community stakeholder groups. And what you'll notice here um, is right in the middle of the screen, you'll see that the uh, District English Learner Advisory Committee, which is today uh, being able to meet. Uh, later in the week, we'll be meeting this in a similar fashion with the District Community Advisory Committee to discuss similar um, processes and conversations. But, but the idea here is, as you can see from, from the timeline, is an iterative process that allows us to continually assess and reassess how we can continue to make uh, improvements. And I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, when we met with our superintendent advisory committee um, earlier this month on August 12, um, one of the committee members provided feedback uh, stating that it's important for the district to recognize that not everyone is going to be able to submit comments via survey or via email or via written form. Uh, and we really took that feedback to heart. So one of the committee members uh, suggested that we set up a budget engagement hotline that effectively acts as a way that we can collect feedback from you uh, through, through the phone rather than through email or text or surveys. And so we set up this budget engagement hotline at 562-248-6867. And at any given point in time during the budget engagement process, we welcome your feedback and all of your and all of your thoughts regarding um, the work that we're doing. And most of the engagement work that we're doing with stakeholders at this particular time as it relates both to the budget as well as to the learning continuity plan uh, is centered around these three questions. And um, these questions have emerged from the fact that um, having analyzed survey results from our stakeholders for the past uh, six months or so, uh, these are the main themes that have emerged. So there's an overarching theme of health and safety that of course is our top priority in the district and is a top priority for you. But within that umbrella theme, we're asking ourselves what practices would be most effective in addressing academic support? What practices would be most effective in addressing social emotional learning? 
and then what practices would be most effective in addressing student engagement and motivation. You can see how they're interconnected and fit with a lot of different ideas that have already um, been discussed in, in other meetings and in other settings. Uh, it's important for us to focus on these three areas because it allows us now to um, fit the, the feedback that you provide the district within the categories of the learning continuity plan, which as you'll see, cover the same exact topics. Okay, so now let, let's discuss the, uh, the learning continuity plan itself. Here you'll see a summary that comes from the California Department of Education's website whose link is at the bottom of the slide. The learning continuity plan is a new state requirement and it is intended to address the quote, ongoing, ongoing need for local educational agencies or districts to formally plan for the 2020-21 school year in the midst of the uncertainty caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, to emphasize, this is a state requirement. So it's something that the California Department of Education has asked all local educational agencies and districts to fulfill um, as, as part of, of what they are expecting us to do. Because it's new and because it's designed to address this uncertainty around the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there's actually, frankly, little guidance from the state as compared to other requirements like the local control and accountability plan and other uh, compliance regulations that, that DLAC is familiar with. It's also when you look at the template at that link, uh, a pretty dense document, uh, very difficult for, for many of us to navigate and understand. Um, so we're doing our best to work with uh, the California Department of Education and our Los Angeles County Office of Education to try to create a plan that is understandable for our stakeholders and that addresses the true needs that we have in our community. Um, but having said that, um, what we've sought to do in the district is this theme of al alignment and coherence. The idea that we don't want a state requirement to be um, disjointed or disconnected from all of our other uh, local planning and engagement efforts. We want everything to be able to fit together so that we can understand how this uh, local con uh, learning continuity plan works and fits with everything that the district is already doing. So you may have noticed on lbschools.net that there is a new 2020-2021 school opening and safety plan. Uh, you can see the, the graphic of the cover page for the school opening and safety plan on this slide. Uh, it is a more parent-friendly document that the district has put together. And the bottom line um, idea that we want to convey to each and every one of you is that when you see the school opening and safety plan, you're actually seeing the learning continuity and attendance plan. They are one in the same. In many respects, they're using the same uh, text and language uh, so that they fit both documents. And for us, it's really important to have a local document like the school opening and safety plan because even after the state requirement for the learning continuity plan is fulfilled, we recognize that as a district, we have to be flexible and dynamic and be able to uh, move along with the times to address the needs uh, presented to us by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we didn't want the idea that the fulfillment of a state requirement would uh, prevent or inhibit the district from being able to make changes and adapt plans based on feedback that we receive from our community. So again, when you see the school opening and safety plan, you can be assured that you are also seeing the learning continuity plan. It's just that this plan here is a much more dynamic plan that reflects um, what we in our community value um, in the district.
Now, the learning continuity plan, apart from having uh, a template, also has a very specific timeline that we have to follow. And I'll draw your attention on this slide to the top and the bottom rows. The top row uh, says August 1. That was when the learning continuity and attendance plan template was released. We had learned that um, the learning continuity and attendance plan would be expected of districts uh, to fulfill. But the actual official template from the California Department of Education, the final version of it was uh, provided to the public at the beginning of the month. Now, go back down to the very bottom and you'll see September 30. That's the official deadline for when the learning continuity and attendance plan has to be completed. So you can see we've got a two month process by which to create the plan itself, uh, engage uh, the community, um, enlist your feedback and incorporate it into our plan and then um, have our board of education adopt it and then be able to submit it to the uh, Los Angeles County Office of Education. This kind of process will be familiar to you as DLAC members because it is a similar process that we follow for the LCAP or the Local Control and Accountability Plan. So that plan normally takes an entire semester, you know, three, four, four and a half months worth of time, sometimes even stretching to uh, six to eight months, depending on the year. And with the learning continuity and attendance plan, we're asked to put it together in a much tighter and abbreviated time frame. So we're, we're doing our best to work with you and with, with the timeline presented to us so that we can fulfill the needs uh, that we have for this plan. A couple of things that, that I will also highlight here. The August 12 Superintendent Advisory Committee meeting and then the launch of our thought exchange survey and the budget workshop occurring on August 17 and 18, uh, as well as this meeting that we're having today as a DLAC committee, alongside the District Community Advisory Committee meeting that we're having this Thursday, all of that is aligned with the efforts uh, that I described earlier regarding the budget engagement process. So if you're asking how does this connect with everything else that we're doing with stakeholder engagement in the district, that's how it fits. It's at these particular points when we are um, bringing all of our efforts together to ensure that we're not duplicating uh, the work that needs to be done in our district. Uh, other things I'll point out, as uh, Mr. Suarez mentioned in his remarks talking about logistics, the draft of the learning continuity and attendance plan has been, has been released already. It was posted last, last Friday and can be found on uh, lbschools.net. So you can see the full draft and read it um, and, and, and compare it with uh, what you're seeing in the presentation today. Then on September 2, we have a public hearing on the learning continuity and attendance plan, uh, followed by on September 16, uh, hopefully a board adoption on the learning continuity and attendance plan. The idea that the public hearing and the board's adoption are in separate meetings is a requirement of the learning continuity and attendance plan. Uh, so we've scheduled it to fit with the current calendar uh, for the Board of Education's meeting in the month of September. So now let's actually dig into the plan itself and what it contains. And I'm gonna go over in this slide a basic overview of the learning continuity and attendance plan section by section, because that way you can see uh, what is contained within the plan itself, and it will aid you in uh, reading the draft of the plan, um, providing feedback to the district, and seeing how it all fits with our budget engagement process. And in fact, here, what we're going to do 
is we're going to talk about different themes associated with our budget engagement process and align it with the sections that you will find in the learning continuity and attendance plan itself. Okay, so starting at the top, the idea of engaging the community and getting feedback from the community is an important component of the budget engagement process that aligns with the first two sections of the learning continuity and attendance plan, which asks us to provide general information about the district and about our plan, and then describe the stakeholder engagement process that we're using um, as part of the plan development. Then you'll see the three guiding questions lining up with the middle section of the learning continuity and attendance plan. So you might remember that the guiding questions that we had for budget engagement related to what are our most effective practices related to academic support, social emotional learning, and student engagement and motivation. Each and every one of those components can be found in the learning continuity and attendance plan. So academic support, you'll find all of the issues and ideas related to that topic in a section in the learning continuity and attendance plan that they call continuity of learning. Social emotional learning ties in with the mental health and social and emotional well-being section. And then student engagement and motivation connects with pupil and family engagement and outreach and school nutrition. And then lastly, you'll hear from our superintendent the idea that this, the district is striving for equity and excellence. And that idea ensures that we are uplifting the needs of those who are most vulnerable during this time, as well as those who have the greatest needs in our community. And for issues and items related to equity and excellence, you'll find them in the learning continuity and attendance plan sections around additional actions and increase or improve services for foster youth, English learners, and low-income students. The bottom line idea here, again, is that anytime the district um, enlists your, your support and your ideas around academic support, social and emotional learning, and student engagement and motivation, all of those themes and ideas relate very specifically to what we are looking to write in the plan under the learning continuity and attendance plan. And in fact, they are also connected with what you see in the school opening and safety plan. So in the next series of slides, we're gonna go through section by section to describe and discuss how the budget engagement process, the learning continuity plan, and the school opening and safety plan fit, to, fit together, okay? So with budget engagement, the theme is community. You'll see that in the learning continuity plan under general information and stakeholder engagement. And then the same ideas and themes are reflected in the message from the superintendent in the school opening and safety plan. And then as it relates to stakeholder engagement, you'll see described in there not just the process that we're embarking on today and in the ensuing meetings and community forums, but also uh, the work that you had been doing with us over the past several months, going all the way back to February. So many of you might remember that there was a thought exchange survey deployed regarding the local control and accountability plan. And then in uh, May, many of you completed completed the K-12 distance and home learning survey to talk about your experiences with uh, distance and home learning uh, during the spring semester. And then thereafter in, in June, the, the last week of the school year, there was another LBUSD family needs survey that was deployed and in which you gave us feedback. If you think about all of these processes in totality, all of them have helped to inform the current draft of the learning continuity plan as you're seeing it today. And we'll continue to go back to all of the ideas that have already been presented to us because they, they're, they're really important and fit together with, with the general uh, thrust of the remarks that you're, that you're giving the district. 
In fact, here are some details on the thought exchange back in February, the K-12 distance and home learning survey, and the LBUSD family needs survey. In total, uh, we received something like 45,000 plus responses from students, from parents, teachers, staff members, members of the community who have done a phenomenal job of, of providing the district with feedback that, that we honor and have tried to enshrine and address in our learning continuity plan. And this is something that is uh, permissible under the plan. The idea that we're looking at not just one set of feedback or ideas from the community, but that we're taking all of the different responses, surveys that, that we've um, used throughout the school year um, to try to inform our plan. So many times people will come to me saying, Robert, um, you know, many times it feels like we don't have enough time to engage with, with a learning continuity plan. And it's because they're looking justifiably at the abbreviated timeline um, for, for the learning continuity plan. And, and, and what I say is, you know, we're working through it together as a community and we're, we're trying to utilize all of the, the different ideas that have already been presented to us as a foundation for this work so that uh, moving forward, we can, we can be assured that it reflects the needs that, that you've already expressed to us as a district. Uh, another thing that you had, you had seen earlier was a reference to our current thought exchange survey that is specifically focused on the budget engagement process and uh, is um, in particular uh, asking questions around our three guiding questions on academic support, social emotional learning, and student engagement and motivation. And I'm happy to report that as of August 24, uh, we had already gotten over 3,300 participants, um, gotten over 2,500 responses and over 85,000 ratings. The benefit of the thought exchange, as many of you who have participated in this uh, can attest, is that even if you don't have your own ideas, you can rate the ideas of of others. So you can view and see feedback from other stakeholders and be able to give it a five-star rating if you agree with it, all the way down to a one-star rating if you don't agree with it. Um, if that sounds familiar to you, it's very similar to how Yelp uh, or Uber work, where um, the, the, the rating system allows us to see which ideas truly resonate with our community. And so here I've given you two examples of, of responses that have already been uh, provided to the district. Um, if you log in to the Thought Exchange survey, you can rate these to see uh, how much you agree with them or provide uh, comments of your own uh, as often as you want um, and then be able to rate as many uh, of the thoughts as, as you have time for. The next part of our learning continuity plan is around academic support. And this relates to the idea of co continuity of learning. Uh, this is the section of the learning continuity plan that is uh, most um, reflected in our school opening and safety plan. As you can see by the number of sections on the far right um, that are addressed by the school opening and safety plan. This relates to our instructional programs. So for example, you will see in our continuity of learning, our plan for how uh, distance learning will operate um, starting uh, on September 1. And I just wanted to highlight an example of how the learning continuity plan and the school opening and safety plan are aligned, uh, as well as how they are represented uh, in, in the planning process. So on the left, you'll see that um, if you read the, the uh, continuity of learning uh, section, 
there is a part where we talk about for about half of this time, students will receive live direct and guided instruction. And teachers also will prepare students for the extended learning and workshop activities in which they'll participate for the second half of the day. That idea is also represented in our school opening and safety plan. Uh, in that plan, you can see on the right that it's in a graphic form as well. So the text is too difficult for, to follow in the learning continuity plan. You can refer to the school opening and safety plan as well and see uh, this kind of sample schedule for first to fifth grade. You'll see the same concept for middle school and for high school, uh, as well as for our, um, our early learning programs. Uh, and also for special education, for English learners, and, and for other students um, with, with needs. The third part here focuses on social emotional learning. And there's a section dedicated just to this topic in the learning continuity plan, as well as the school opening and safety plan. And here again, you'll see the district's approach uh, to this issue. So for example, we know that social emotional learning, this is the process of developing the self-awareness, self-control and interpersonal skills that are vital for school work and life success. That's how this topic is described and defined in the learning continuity plan. And then in our school opening and safety plan, there's a section where it talks about district and school staff are committed to supporting students' uh, social and emotional wellness and offering resources uh, to ensure that students transition back to school smoothly. The idea that not only are the academics critical, um, but that also we must pay attention to the social and emotional well-being of our students is feedback that we've received time and time again from, from yourself. Uh, and it is enshrined in the learning continuity plan, uh, the process that we'll be taking uh, to ensure that, that that area and that need gets, gets addressed. On to the latter half of the plan. So student engagement and motivation, you'll see it connected with the pupil and family engagement and outreach and school nutrition sections in the learning continuity plan. And then also in the instructional program and special education and um, uh, mental health portions of the school opening and safety plan. Here you'll see described our tiered levels of support for student participation. The question of what are we as a district going to do in the event that students are not engaged in online learning uh, this school year? And it is, a, it is an important issue and topic that we've spent a lot of time on discussing with other stakeholders. You've given us great feedback on the importance of having many different approaches and many different interventions to try to engage our families and our students in order to ensure that the neediest among us are able to participate. So that goes in terms of a tiered system from a universal and personalized approach to early intervention and intensive support. And this kind of tiered level of support um, intensifies based on the data in other words, if we notice that uh, a student has missed an interaction online or a couple of interactions online, it's going to, to um, prompt our school to conduct very specific sets of outreach with our families. And then if we still are unable to get a hold of families, you'll see an intervention and intensive support that um, we will utilize in order to, to address the needs of those who have the greatest struggles. Again, this is a reflection of the ideas and, and um, concepts that you've already presented to the district, and we're very grateful that we're able to um, articulate that in the pupil and family engagement section of the learning continuity plan. And Robert, hi. Hi. So I think this might be a great time to maybe, um, since we're moderating the 
comments coming in through our Google form. So first of all, thank you to all the viewers who are contributing their thoughts on our Google form. It's nice to know it's working and you are using it. Um, there is one question that I think might be um, a good time to interject. So I'm sorry, Robert. So it's a question in Spanish, so I will do my very best. I'll read it in Spanish and then I will read it and translate it. Um, so it says in Spanish, Disculpe mi pregunta, yo como madre de familia, tengo cuatro hijos, pero quiero saber si el distrito tiene una forma o una ayuda sobre el internet. Yo tengo, pero es muy lento y se imagina cuando comienzan las clases vamos a batallar. So in Spanish, it says, excuse me, my question is that I am a mother, I have four children, and I'd like to know if the district has a way or some assistance with the internet. I have one, I have the internet, but it's very slow. And as you could imagine, once school begins, we're going to, it's going to be a challenge. That, so I don't know if you want to address that question, Robert. Absolutely, that's a great question. And it's a very common question that we receive about the issue of access to devices and connectivity, uh, which is what that, um, that particular question and, and feedback relates to. And I'm gonna go back a couple of slides to the section on continuity of learning. And first I'm gonna talk about what's in the plan and then, and then also explain some specific support that a family like um, the one who gave us this feedback can, can pursue in order to try to get their needs addressed. So in the plan, it is contained in the continuity of learning. There is a section there where it talks about access to devices and connectivity. And we describe as a district what we're doing to distribute Chromebooks to our families in case they need a device, uh, as well as um, hotspots to, uh, to, to families who need uh, more reliable internet access. It also describes their uh, partnership that we have with a nonprofit organization that can help families access low cost or sometimes free of charge internet access to uh, be, be and have it, uh, have it be more reliable. So usually the process that a, that a family would take uh, is to connect with their school and, uh, and, and contact um, uh, someone at their school site who can then help them um, get access to uh, a hotspot or, or, or a Chromebook. And then in the event that that is uh, something that, that they need further assistance with, uh, they can also contact the level office. So if, if it's an elementary student, you can contact the elementary school um, uh, school office here in the district. Or if it's uh, middle and K-8, you can contact the middle and K-8 office. If it's high school, you can contact our high school office. But we can connect you with the resources that are necessary in order to address precisely that need. Lucy, is there, are there other questions that, um, that are coming up? Um, yes, thank you, Robert. Uh, so there was another question. Um, so this one is in English. I'm going to read, um, one says, I am a working parent who works 12 hour shifts, 7 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. I am concerned about attendance during live streaming since there will be two days out of the week that I won't be able to assist my second grader to log on. I will be able to help get the day's work done once I get home. So will there be a leniency on grading in these instances? Grades should be based on work completed and not just live participation. That's, a, that's another great question. And it's a common one that we've received around grading practices and, and policies. So of course, that's also addressed in both our school opening plan as well as the learning continuity plan. Um, and usually what we, what we recommend to parents is that they interact directly with their teacher to talk about expectations for their students in that class. Um, because many times, with, with in terms of grading, there's going to be um, 
uh, an understanding of the expectations from the teacher. And what, what we would we would want parents to do or encourage parents to do is talk to their their teachers um, regarding what what um, what accommodations might be made on on account of some of these challenges that families are experiencing. And then if you know things are not resolved at either a teacher level um, or at an assistant principal level, can you can also connect with an administrator at a school site, such as a principal, uh, so that you can have your needs addressed. But this is a great kind of question to work with your school sites with in terms of uh, what the grading expectations and practices are going to be as it relates to the unique needs that your student has uh, in your family. Are there, are there any other remarks or questions? There are, but I think I'll let you continue your presentation and then uh, we'll come back to um, some of the comments. Yeah, Lucy, do you have any others that you'd like to add on that question around grading and grading practices? No, I think what you said is, um, I think there's more information to come. I think, um, you know, as we are navigating through these times, I think all more information will follow. Okay. Wonderful. These are great questions. So we, again, thank you very much for, for the feedback. Um, again, addressing many of, of the ideas that, that are important to you and, and are, are being communicated to us. So we're, we're grateful for, for that. So now we're reaching the tail end of the plan. And this relates to the theme of equity and excellence, which is an important priority for our superintendent and our board of education. Uh, it's found in the latter two sections of the learning continuity plan under additional actions and increase or improved services for foster youth English learners and low income students. And then also provided in the, um, the two uh, sections of the school opening and safety plan that are um, bulleted in the far right of this slide. And here you'll find um, a variety of different programs um, we can't detail every single one of them, but among the actions that you'll see include uh, summer programs. For example, we had a, um, a summer enrichment and learning or SEAL program that took place over the summer, had over 3,000 participants, I believe, and, and was, was very successful with, with the specific intention of addressing learning loss or, or mitigating learning loss for, for our students to ensure that they can be successful in this upcoming school year. That was an attempt to be proactive, knowing that uh, many of our students um, have either fallen behind or are, are struggling to, to try to keep up in, in the, the difficult times that we're facing. Other things that you'll see in there include um, the family resource centers, which provide counseling, social, and emotional, mental health uh, type of support to, to families. Um, they, they actually were operating over the summer, uh, something that, that was a, an extension of the, the work that they had been doing previously, and they've been addressing the specific needs of those who have uh, some struggles in our community. Um, you'll also see an increased emphasis on social, emotional learning, resources, and activities. When we did our LVUSC family needs survey, one of the most important feedbacks from families was to um, spend time during the day to give students an opportunity to engage in wellness activities, social emotional learning activities, um, you know, things that are not specifically uh, related to their coursework or their academics, but are related to their overall well being as a child. And we really took that to heart because we knew and fully recognized that our, our kids are gonna come in with greater needs than they had previously. And we wanted to make sure that we were able to address the whole child and the needs of them as, as individuals um, uh, in addition to meeting their needs academically. And by the way, when, when we talk about social emotional learning here in the district, we're not only talking about the social emotional well being of our students and our families, we're also trying to address the social emotional well being of our staff as well. 
So you'll see described um, resources that we're making available to our teachers and to uh, staff members, both at school sites and in district offices, because we, we recognize fully well that if the staff members have um, empty cups, if you will, then it's going to be even more difficult and challenging for them to address the needs of our students. So we're, we're, we're understanding and cognizant of the needs of everyone involved in our school system, both students, families, as well as staff members as it relates to social and emotional well-being. And then you'll see some very specific activities and services and actions related to specific groups that are required for us to address in the learning continuity plan and, are, and that are really, really important to us in our community given the diversity of our district. Supports related to English learners, to students with exceptional needs, to foster youth, and to, to students experiencing homelessness. And as it relates to DLAC specifically, uh, you're gonna want to make sure that you pay close attention in, in our plan to the areas that are um, addressing the needs of our English learners. So the idea that um, there are challenges for students in general as it relates to um, being able to access uh, online education or distance learning, we, we understand that for English learners, it will be even more challenging for them. So there are services and interventions that are considered um, for adaptation to, to an online environment, as well as a specific outreach uh, that, that's being conducted by our staff to support the needs of our English learner families. And of course, it's something that um, uh, Ms. Ensminger is very familiar with and can discuss um, if, if necessary during this particular presentation, but you'll see it represented in our, um, in our plan. So with that, you've just received a summary of the learning continuity plan and seen how it relates to our budget engagement process and to stakeholder engagement overall in our district. I wanted to bring back this slide around our guiding questions because this is what's going to help cultivate further dialogue between the district and our stakeholders. So again, ideas and questions you might have around academic support, social emotional learning, and student engagement and motivation. I'm gonna pause now to see if we have any, any, anything around these areas or any other questions, remarks that are coming in through our, through our feedback forms. I'm going to check. There is a question um, or comment, Robert. Uh, one is, I'm going to read it in Spanish and then I'll try to translate it in English. It says, Tienen contemplado ofrecer tutoría para tratar de solucionar la pérdida de aprendizaje. También, ¿cómo van a manejar las ausencias de los estudiantes? Um, ¿Se les ayudará o se les castigará? So the first part of that question was, have you contemplated offering tutoring to help solve learning loss? Also, how will you handle absences of students? Will you be helping or will you be punishing? That's a, another great series of questions. Tutoring is, an, is a, um, one of the programs that is continually provided to the district as a potential solution. And yes, we've, we've encouraged our teachers they can provide tutoring to their specific students. And also our school sites uh, as a whole, being able to think about school-wide types of tutoring opportunities or interventions specifically related to a child's needs. So you might see some of these kinds of supports in different ways. Sometimes it might look like um, a tutoring program that is with a teacher um, of being conducted virtually, um, either in a small group of student, uh, a small group of the class, or individually with an individual student. Uh, it, could, it could focus on a specific subject area, like it's math or it's English language arts. Um, or, or social studies or science. 
or it could be something that is focused around the specific needs of a child. So if it's an English learner, something around their, their language acquisition. Or a school-wide type of program, you might see that it's being provided not by the child's specific teacher, but by someone else at a school site who has expertise in that area, either a teacher on special assignment or a program specialist, or even an administrator or counselor, depending on the needs. If it is related to social emotional well-being, it could be with, with a counselor even, right? So we want to think about tutoring, not just in terms of what we normally think about tutoring, which is like one-on-one -on -one support or doing homework help, but also thinking about different needs and ways that we can bring resources from our schools and from our district to support the needs of a particular child. And what you'll see is a, as an attempt by our school sites and our staff members to try to make it custom to the needs of a, of, of a child uh, and, and also to the needs of a, of a specific classroom. So if you notice I'm talking in general terms, it's because uh, in many respects with the tutoring program, you're going to see it reflected slightly differently depending on the grade level as well as depend, depending on the school site. Similarly, you're going to see uh, different kinds of programs that are supplemental to, to the normal academic program at a school site. So at around 50 plus different school sites in our district, we have our RAP program. It's an extended learning program or after school program. Um, they also provide and conduct tutoring with our students, uh, as well as social emotional activities, et cetera. If you wanna know whether your school site has that RAP program, you can visit lbschools.net and look under the, the letter W and see if your school site has, has RAP involved in it. And in these kinds of programs, sometimes we partner with the YMCA, with the Boys and Girls Club, or another nonprofit organization to provide tutoring services, homework help, and, and things like that um, for your family. I mean, I'm describing all of this because sometimes you're gonna see the tutoring not, not so much quote unquote after school, uh, sometimes it might be during, um, you know, before school or even during school uh, and be able to address things in that way. As it relates to attendance and engagement, that's what this graphic was relating to. So you might remember this, this picture where it talks about interactions or student participation. Uh, teachers will go over with, with, with students in their class around what they mean by an interaction online. But they will be keeping track of, of attendance to try to ensure that students are engaging and participating. But as you can see here, the district's intent is to try to be supportive of our students um, because we know and understand and recognize that it is very challenging for our families right now to balance their needs both at home and with their kids' education. So we're, we want to try to provide support to our families and explore many different options by which we can um, walk alongside families to try to ensure that our students are engaged in attending. Uh, and, and then also discuss with them the, the expectations and accountability for families to ensure that, that the participation from our, from our students are consistent. Do you have time, Robert, for another question? Absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Let me go back. So there's another question. Um, this question, um, not, not well, I'll just read it in Spanish and then I'll uh, translate it into um, English. In Spanish. ¿Qué tan accesible estarán los directores o los consejeros para hablar con nosotros, los padres, que ya hay ocasiones que mandamos correo or queremos hablar con ellos y no nos llaman jamás. In English, how accessible will um, principals or counselors be to speaking with us, um, the parents? Because there have been occasions where we have sent mail, I'm assuming emails, um, and we want to, or we want to speak with them and they don't call us back ever. Um, first of all, we, um, on behalf of the school side, I apologize if you had that kind of experience. And it's, it's always something that, that we pay very close attention to because we want to make sure that your needs are being addressed. Um, 
ongoing communication is something that we emphasize with our school sites. In fact, last week and then this week as well, we're, we're, we're doing trainings with all of our staff members here in the district. Um, professional development around communication with our families and specifically communication with our students and families as it relates to our new learning management system or Canvas. You're going to hear more about what, what this Canvas feature is, this app that we're using um, to, um, uh, to, to ensure that we have a, a positive, consistent uh, learning experience online for our students. But one of the intents of having a centralized learning management system like, like Canvas was to try to ensure consistent communication between our school sites and, and you as parents. So, you know, we can continue, you can continue as families to communicate with our, with our sites via emails, via phone calls, and, and, our, and our staff are working at, at school sites um, um, in, in, their, in, in offices to try to address needs of families. In many cases, they're actually also conducting direct outreach to families, trying to ensure and, and uh, confirm whether our students are, are going to be participating in, in um, online learning this upcoming fall. So you may receive communications from, from our school sites, and we ask that you would respond to, to them as well. But yes, the idea that um, we want to be responsive to communications from families is, is an ongoing priority for us. And one of the many reasons why we're using now a new uh, Canvas system is because we want to make sure that the communication is consistent all across the school system. The only thing that we ask as it comes to Canvas is that you be patient with our staff at school sites, especially during the first couple of weeks of the school year. They're going to be doing their best to try to get back to, to you um, if you send them an email or a phone call. But as you can imagine, uh, with the start of the school year and with a new system that we're putting in place, teachers are still getting acclimated with how uh, to use the Canvas system and, and how it, to blend it with the educational experience that they're going to be giving your children. So of course, there are going to be some bumps and hiccups along the way. And uh, if, if some of the communications are late, um, please be patient with them. They're gonna try to get back to you as soon as, as they can. And if for whatever reason you continue to need additional support, you can feel free to communicate with uh, either the level office or a parent coordinator at parent university here at EACCR. Um, and we can provide some assistance to you as well. More questions, Robert? Yeah. Okay. Here's a question. It's regarding um, concerns around health and safety. In Spanish, it says, and then I'll read it in English. Um, in Spanish, se abrirán las escuelas ya que el gobierno manifieste que es seguro porque se estaba manejando una fecha que es octubre 5. Octubre in English, will schools be opened once the government decides it is safe? Um, why was there a date con considered of October 5th? Um, in, in this particular question, I'll, I'll also um, defer to Yumi or, 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 or even Renee, others on the call, if they have any expertise or insight that they want to lend to the question around the October 5th date. But, um, the, you know, the, for us as a district in general, um, we have to be very flexible and be responsive to um, how the pandemic is in our community. And we're, very, we're working very closely, as, as you'll see when you read the, the section around uh, safety and school opening uh, in the school opening plan, as well as in the, the first part of the le learning continuity plan. The idea that we, we work very closely with the public health department at the state as well as uh, in the county and even here in Long Beach with our, with, our, with our city's public health officer. And it is with their guidance and expertise and uh, you know, scientific understanding that we make a determination as to what would be safe for our school system. 
and any and all school reopening plans that we may embark upon, uh, whether it's act right after October 5 or, or down the line, is gonna be in consultation with public health experts. Um, safety is our most important priority right now. Uh, and we want to ensure that both for the sake of our families, as well as for our staff, that everything is going to be safe and secure before we embark upon school openings. Okay, Robert, here's, um, here's another question. Um, good afternoon, oh, I'm sorry, in Spanish, sorry, in Spanish. Buenas tardes, mi preocupación es cuántos ¿Cuántos alumnos por clase tendrán en el aula durante las clases híbridas? Gracias. In English, good afternoon. My concern is how many students will be in each class during hybrid classes? Thank you. That's a great question. At this, at this particular time, I, I personally don't have an answer to that specific question. Um, we can ensure that in written responses that we address that particular question with some, some specific details, but I'll also defer to some of my colleagues if they have, um, if they have an answer to that question. Uh, Robert, I'll jump in here and just let um, everybody know that all, all of the classrooms on all of the campuses have been reviewed by um, our facilities experts and um, the, the classrooms themselves, I think the max, uh, the largest classroom was to hold 17 students utilizing the social distancing rules and all of the um, uh, information from the health department. Thanks, Renee. Okay. More questions? Yeah. Okay. This one is in English. It says, can you unpack the supports in the LCP um, that are specific to EL students? That's a great question. So um, I'm gonna, if I turn to, um, you don't, you can't see it, but I'm turning to what is in the learning continuity plan so I can describe that for you. Um, the pages are slightly different, whether you're looking at the draft in English in Spanish or in Khmer, uh, but in the English version, the English learner supports are contained on um, page nine, and then you'll see it also in, in other sections of the plan. So you'll see under page in page nine, the district has worked closely with the Council of Great City Schools, with with LACO, the, the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and student achievement partners to try to devise programs and supports for our English learners, particularly emerging bilingual students during distance learning in the following areas, learning loss, instructional supports for teachers who support our English learners, and social emotional learning. So you see the specific programs detailed there. Uh, with learning loss, that was a pretty important priority with the elementary and middle school summer SEAL program. Um, because the idea there was that we, we wanted to ensure that, um, that the uh, designated English language development instruction would, would occur um, uh, with, with uh, support for our English learners in that program. And then uh, the 2020-21 core unit, core content unit guides are gonna be inclusive of guidance around how we assess the needs of our, of our English learners and be able to provide supports that are differentiated for our EL students and families. Uh, and then you'll see some additional details around uh, su instructional supports for, for teachers as it relates to their core content unit guides. And then social emotional learning is gonna be really important for our English learners as well. So we have uh, our, our, our curriculum departments devise smart start units um, that allow teachers to explicitly cultivate a classroom atmosphere where there's a sense of belonging and social emotional well being being prioritized that that helps the needs of our English learners. Uh, and, and a lot of this is uh, intentionally built in to our curriculum based on the California English learner roadmap uh, and using that as a guide. 
So you know, these are just some examples of what you see contained in, um, in the learning continuity plan right now. And as we further develop the, the plan, we'll add other programs and supports um, to, to this section. If others on the call want to lend their expertise as well beyond what's currently in the plan, uh, please feel free to share some, some of your other insights too before Lucy um, brings up another question. Okay. Thank you, Robert. So here's another question. Do you guys have a set day in which parents will get trained on Canvas? So I'll say right now, teachers are this spending this week being trained for Canvas themselves, including how to teach students to use Canvas. And then further than that, I, I'm not sure of any other dates unless someone else on this call has more information. Yes, so um, our parent university team, which is the team that um, provides um, workshops for parents uh, on YouTube, uh, and, and, and of course during, um, during normal times also in person. They're currently working on workshops that will specifically provide training for parents as it relates to Canvas. So they're working closely with our teachers to determine the most important pieces of information that parents will need to know to be able to navigate that site and that app and to be able to support their kids. Having said that, there is already a video that's being developed this week and will be um, provided to, to families and the community around Canvas that will provide an overview of how it will work. You can expect that before the, the school year begins, because I know right now for a fact that they are, they're translating the materials and, and getting, getting the Canvas um, overview up and running. That'll, that'll help to kind of shed some light on, you know, how the accounts work, um, how to navigate the site, and in, in general, how, how the site works. And then over the next month or two, we're going to be deploying uh, specific trainings around how to specifically use the, 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 uh, the Canvas tool as a parent, um, and, and then um, be able to go into the different features that are contained in it. Okay, how about um, a mindful of the time? So uh, maybe maybe two or three more questions, depending on the, the length. Okay, um, there's two questions kind of related. Um, they relate to screen time for students. So I will read um, them in Spanish and then I will make an attempt to translate them. Okay, all right, in Spanish. Me gustaría, oh, I'm sorry, um, let me see, I'm so sorry. Los niños um, que van a estudiar en línea, ¿cuánto tiempo estarán en la computadora? In English, the children who will be studying online, how much time will they spend on the computer? And that question also um, is aligned to another question, if I can meet, if I can read it as well. Yep. Okay, so in Spanish, anteriormente era muy importante no estar tanto tiempo, perdón, no estar tanto tiempo estar en frente una computadora, teléfono, etc. Ahora se la van a pasar todo el día frente a ella porque cuando acaben sus clases van a tener que hacer su tarea. ¿Cómo lo van a manejar los maestros? ¿Van a calificar las tareas? In Spanish, um, before, it was very important not to spend so much time in front of a computer or a phone, etc. Now they're going to spend the whole day in front of them um, because once they're done with classes, they will have to um, do their work or homework. How will you man? How will teachers manage that? Are they going to grade homework and or work schoolwork? Um, I, wanna, so I wanted to, so Robert, if it's okay with you, I wanted to share mm -hmm. um, 
and I'll say this in English, that you know, we know that there's a lot of concerns around the amount of screen time for students. Um, and I know that for elementary, I can speak for elementary, um, you know, students will not be on camera or on the screen during the school day for five to six hours per day. So in fact, you know, the elementary students, and I, again, I'm being very specific about elementary, and I have two children that are in elementary schools. Um, so this, the students in elementary will receive about three hours of what we would call live instruction from their teachers, and then about two hours per day where they'll have a chance to complete tasks independently or in collaboration um, with other students um, online, of course. Um, but they'll also have access to their teacher if they need help during that time. Um, Live instruction doesn't mean they're going to be staring at, at the screen or listening to the teacher talk the entire time. So for example, um, a student may watch a 15 minute lesson and then take their eyes off the screen and have to complete it on their own for 15 to 20 minutes um, and or complete the task in a workbook. But all that is included in those three hours of, of time with the teacher live. So there's going to be also breaks throughout the day, the schedules that elementary students are um, will have for the school day will include 10 minute breaks. There will be mindful moments and time for movement. So they're going to be giving opportunities for that as well as a full lunch 40 minute period for both the students and for the teachers so that they can, you know, kind of refresh and move and rest the eyes and then come back to the screen whenever they need to. That's a great response. And actually uh, an important question that we are getting a lot more of. So I'm glad that you provided um, those details, uh, Lucy. Thank you. I know it's a concern for many parents and understandably so, myself included. Okay. Um, what other, did you, one more questions? Yeah, one more question. Okay, uh, so one other question is um, regarding Canvas, this one's in English. Regarding Canvas, will parents have their own accounts? My understanding is yes. And that, and that, is, and that, that is in fact why uh, we're going to be providing some trainings for parents as well on how to navigate the system. And also I'd like to add to that, Robert, that, um, and I don't know if it's, so I'm, I'm apologizing. Um, I know that once students set up their accounts and once students are in Canvas, that's when parents will have access to Canvas. Oh, good. They won't have access to Canvas before the students. It will be once the students are in and once they're up and running, then parents will have access. Yeah, okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. excellent. Okay, so I wanted to, um, um, honoring everyone's time, um, conclude with, with our next steps. First of all, let, let me just uh, thank you all again for your patience, your great questions. You can hear a lot of the great feedback that you've been providing us around screen time, social emotional learning, the needs of our English learners, and all of the issues that are important to you. And um, we, we really can't thank you enough for um, engaging with us despite some of the, the challenges of doing it in this way. And as, as you know, we're going to continue to collect feedback from you uh, and then be able to provide some responses in, in written form as part of our obligation with the DLAC. And so in terms of next steps, um, there are a couple of things that you can do if you want to continue to engage in these topics or if you have continued questions. First is you can use that same link in that same form to submit other public comments over the next 48 hours as uh, James uh, described in, in his opening remarks. So that link will continue to be there for, for the next couple of days. And you can continue to provide feedback in, in the same way that you are doing so during this, the, during this meeting. And the, the benefit of that is that the district will, will provide a written response to, to the committee and to the public as it relates to each of these questions, both even the ones that we've addressed here today, uh, as well as the ones that, um, that, that have not been addressed uh, during our committee meeting today.
The second is that you can participate in a thought exchange survey. It's, it's a similar concept. So even after the next 48 hours are up and you still have that extra thought or you want to see what others have already provided the district, um, you can go on lbschools.net and at the very bottom of the page, you'll see a link to our thought exchange survey where you can give us your, your thoughts on academic supports, on social emotional learning, and on student engagement and motivation. And the great thing about that is that you can see uh, other people's responses and be able to write them as well as provide your own feedback. And then lastly, for those who would prefer just to um, voice their, their ideas, you know, we understand that it's, it's not easy sometimes to write, um, um, to write a comment or to um, respond to a survey. You can feel free to call our budget engagement hotline at 562-248-6867, and we're happy to receive your feedback that way as well. You're not going to get someone answering that call. It's, it goes to a messaging system, but that messaging system allows us to collect your feedback in a structured way so that we can ensure that it gets incorporated into the plan depending on the kind of issue that it's presented there. And the other thing is that you can leave a message in your own language, you know, whether that's English, Spanish, Khmer, Russian, Chinese, Tagalog, um, whatever is comfortable for you, we're happy to receive your feedback in, in the language of your preference so that we can ensure that you're, you're comfortable in providing your feedback. And again, we thank the committee members at the Superintendent Advisory Committee for giving us this idea of, of having a hotline so that we can continue to engage with our stakeholders in, a, in many different ways. On that note, I want to stop sharing my screen. And um, thank you all once again for, for your engagement and your feedback during this meeting. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Ms. Ensminger who's going to adjourn the, the committee. Thank you, Mr. Tagorda, for your presentation. At this time, I will once again invite Mr. Suarez um, for a few reminders for public uh, parent feedback. Good afternoon, once again. I am going to share my screen as Mr. Tagorda shared. Um, we are very interested in the um, comments. So I just wanna make sure that I um, highlight this one more time. Um, First of all, all of these links are in the agenda, and here is how that you access the agenda. bit.ly slash DLAC agenda 82520. For the draft plan, I am going to get out of here and show you directly where you can go. So this is Long Beach Unified School District, that's lbschools.net, lbschools.net. And if you look down here for local control, you can click that and you'll see the learning continuity attendance plan drafts are here. The learning continuity attendance plan and drafts are in English, Spanish, and Khmer. Our Attendance, so if you have not signed in yet, we really appreciate you to sign in. And that is actually one way that we can get in touch with you regarding the answers and um, feedback that you've given. So we are gonna be responding in writing, but the way to get the response is by signing in today. So if you take a look at this to sign in, it's bit.ly slash og. 25 sign in please sign in today so that you can receive the response and last but not least and thank you mr tagorda for reiterating this this is our place for comments questions that will be open for the next 48 hours and it is bit.ly slash og 25 comments so we hope that um in this time of um unusual reality for our meeting that you have um, these helpful links that will um, enable you to comment 
write concerns, ask questions. So I appreciate all of the, um, all of the um, people who are here today and thank you very much. And I'm gonna throw it right back over to Martha Ensminger. Thank you for being here today. Once again, we wanna thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend our meeting. We look forward to having our students return to school when it is safe to do so. And I look forward to our next meeting scheduled on Tuesday, September 21st. I will send you more information in the link. Our district and DLAC staff wish you well. Have a wonderful day and the rest of the week. Meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Muchas gracias.